Thanks for coming. We'll start the second session now. So the first presenter will be Shityan Jang from Simon Fraser. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Jitian Zhang and from Simon Fraser University. I'm a PhD student and uh, today I'm very happy uh, to be here to present our IROS 2021 paper, a multimodal and hybrid framework for human navigational intent inference. So why human navigational intent inference? Uh, for our research, we focus on in an indoor environment where potentially there is human-robot interaction. And as we all know, human agents are hard to predict in this environment. And for social robots to be socially acceptable, they need to be safe and smart to navigate around humans. And currently, there are only limited data sets for the indoor human-robot interactions and uh, human navigations that could benef potentially benefit uh, robot navigations. So uh, in order to achieve our, uh, do our research, so we collect a novel data set for indoor human-robot interactions. So we design an experiment where part human participants will take the role of shoppers and who will pick up five to six uh, specific items from given list to simulate a, sh a shopping scenario. And uh, we record image data and motion capture data of humans. And uh, in this experiment, we also use SoftBank Robotics Pepper Robot uh, to interact with humans to provide assistance. So for the data set, uh, 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 I'm playing a small clip of our collected data set. This is the video data. And some key highlights of our data set is that we have five, five cameras from different angles in the room, and we have motion capture data on the human participants. All data are synchronized video and motion capture data, and we recruit total of 108 human participants. Uh, we have single person experiment as shown in this clip, and we also have two people sessions where people interact with each other and where social behaviors may be observed. And uh, the experiment is designed to encourage human-robot interaction as well as uh, human navigation in the room. So the data set is public available, and we have over 30 hours video data right now, and there will be more. So next, uh, what is human? So what is uh, human navigational intent inference? Our goal is to predict where the person will be in real world coordinate at a near future and uh, to re also to reconstruct a possible future trajectories and uh, the positions they might occupy uh, to benefit uh, robot navigation algorithms. So to achieve our goal, we propose our multimodal and hybrid framework. Uh, we use a learning-based method and the classical methods these two methods work jointly together to infer human navigational intent. The learning-based method is a prediction module which uh, utilizes visual information to predict a future goal location. And the, the classical methods will use the future goal location to reconstruct a future path or positions uh, to the goal. And uh, to be more specific in the prediction modules, uh, we propose three features. Uh, we use uh, body pose of the human. Uh, we use human motions and the head orientations. Uh, and uh, uh, we use these features and we develop a, a hybrid neural network, which is a LSTM CNN, which works very well with our proposed features and to predict uh, future goal locations. And for the reconstruction modules, we use two methods. Uh, one is differential flatness, and the other one is reachability analysis. Uh, the, these two methods are based on the uh, predicted future goal locations, and as well as past uh, locations to predict uh, future trajectories or positions. So uh, we evaluate our uh, methods over various baselines, and the results shows that our methods outperform all the other baseline methods in terms of final displacement error. We've also tested uh, uh, our model with different amount of training data to show our data efficiency. 
and the results show that our model is more accurate and data efficient. And here it's showing the reconstruction part. So we, we have two uh, reconstruction methods. The first one is spline reconstructions, and we, uh, we just uh, compute the spline based on the past location and the future predicted location. And the results uh, based on the displacement error shows that we have similar displacement errors compared to the learning-based methods, but we are more data efficient. And for the reachability analysis, uh, the reachability computes the future, uh, the, the possible locations the person may occupy, and we test it on about 6,000 trajectories, and uh, about 75% of the trajectories are inside the zones where uh, we compute it. So here's a brief example, and uh, that's the real data from our data set. As you can see, uh, the, uh, the person is shopping and they're trying to pick up items or looking for items. And uh, just from these images, it's a very hard, uh, it's a very hard task for, hum for human to predict where this person might go in the future. And uh, so, but for, uh, for models uh, with the next frame to be uh, this, and uh, we can show that our model uh, can make some uh, predictions based on the body pose and head orientations and uh, with very little error. So to conclude uh, our research, uh, to conclude this paper, uh, so we have present a framework that combines the advantage of learning-based methods and the classical methods. So the experiment results show that the human body pose and head orientations are important features to accurately predict the human navigational intent. And also our results show that uh, our framework is more accurate and data efficient. And uh, here also I want to talk about some of our future work. So the first one is our virtual 3D human platforms. Uh, so we try to. Oh, so we've uh, we've uh, leveraged the multiple cameras we have, and we've uh, extract 3D poses, and we've uh, built a 3D virtual pla uh, human platform, with also as well as with some post forecasting in this work. Uh, the other work is called uh, when to interrupt, uh, detecting human in need of help, because we discover in our data set. There are very large amount of time the, uh, the human participants uh, require assistance, are looking confused or looking hesitate. So uh, we've, uh, we're putting our data onto Amazon Mechanical Turk to get annotations and we'll go from there. And uh, that's all for my presentation and thank you for your time and uh, I'll take any questions you have. We have time for a couple of questions. Do you see this as being applicable to pedestrian prediction for you know, car? Yeah, car? I do. Because uh, I think you know, also for pedestrians, the body pose and hair orientation, these features are very useful. But it also depends on the uh, environment. Uh, different environment has different behaviors. So it's about the training data it will be different. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. And the next presenter is Ian Rankin from Oregon State University. So hello everyone, my name is Ian. I'm with uh, Dr. Hollinger at OSU. Uh, so I'll be talking about using language instructions to generate constraints for scientific data collection robots. So one example of this is from the marine domain is where ocean scientists are uh, studying coastal upwelling fronts, and these scientists need to design robot plans that can collect the most useful information. Uh, and so we can think about this problem on this like graph on the right here, where a robot is trying to collect information about the robot or about the environment, uh, and we want scientists to be able to collect the most useful data. So there's some set of budget in the robot, and we want to collect, go to the places that we can get the most information from. It. But the problem with this is that setting these constraints is very hard. It requires domain knowledge from both the robotic side as well as the scientist side. And so what we're proposing doing is using language instructions as this way to provide these constraints between the two. 
And so they're like, the main key insight that we're taking from this is that semantic features can be used as the way to provide this interface between the human and the robot to communicate. So looking at some related work, uh, I break this down into how much language corpus is required to take this uh, constraint problem. So the works of embodied AI has typically takes this language instruction, some perception data as well, runs some sort of deep learning, and then outputs a plan or action. But this requires a lot of language corpus data as well as a dense simulator to run this with. And we don't necessarily have this for these field robotic domains that we're interested in. The next set of work uh, breaks this down and takes uh, language instructions, breaks them down into plan constraints, and then uses a classical robot planner. But this like probabilistic graphical model that we use in the middle uh, still takes a decent amount of language corpus. So instead, our proposed method here requires uh, no language corpus in order to train because we're using it directly from dependency information from pre-trained models. So our contributions here is first the, uh, that framework that maps the language instructions to planner constraints, and then second, using this in a useful manner to generate plans that are, are interesting. So looking first at this language grounding side of it, uh, we'll, we use the Stanford parser, and the Stanford parser is this natural language processing tool which takes generalized knowledge from language tasks to find the structure of the sentence. And then this sentence is returned in the form of a dependency tree that breaks up the sentence into its constituents' parts. Uh, and so we then have a rule-based framework that takes this dependency tree and breaks it down into the different uh, grounded constraints. So an example of this is for the instruction, go to the southernmost up along front, we have this dependency tree. And we start at the top of the tree, we look at this root dependency, and we know that this is some sort of single or a shortest path plan that we want to do because it's saying go. Next, we go to this uh, oblique nominal relationship here, and we know this is some sort of feature in the environment because it says up along front, we don't know which of these two up along fronts in the environment we're thinking about. We can take this adjective modifier that has southernmost, and now we can down select to just being the up along front bravo because we know it's the, the southern one. But so we now know, have, know which feature is in the environment we're looking at. We don't know what this type of feature it is. We could be saying going around the up along front, but using this uh, case relationship with two, we know that it's the destination. So we fully define the robot plan here of a shortest path planner going to up along front Bravo. So the next part of this is thinking about how do we use useful constraints that the human can provide. And so what we look at is using topological constraints, because this allows us to say things like route to the north of the island or south of the island or something like this. And so if we look at homotopy, uh, homotopy classes, so if we look at this path on the right here, uh, path A and B are in the same homotopy class if you can be continuously deformed into each other. So if you think about a string along path A, if you can deflect that into B without cutting it, they're in the same homotopy class. On the other side, path C is not in the same homotopy class because you have to cut the string in order to get to there. And so we actually use homology classes, which are similar to homotopy classes for our constraints, except they're unordered. So if you say uh, north of I object one, south of object two, we don't compare, care about the temporal constraint. So either this blue or the red path is valid for that type of instruction. So then we did some results of this uh, work. So taking a synthetic data set of language instructions that we generated and then a known set of grounded constraints to attach to that, we had about a million of these and uh, we had pretty good results. So we had valid where it generated the correct constraints exactly, failure where it did something incorrectly, and then there were some cases where it didn't know which of the features it was talking about, and so you can ask the user, oh, which one did you mean? Did you want the northernmost or the southernmost one? And so from these, we got about 6.5% failure rate, which is, is pretty good in the literature. So next, we tested out the full system on a set of language instructions that we got from oceanographers uh, at OSU. And so they had these th three different plans they wanted to run at the same time, which are flying uh, gliders to various waypoints along a line that they defined, and then one that's going north and one that's going south. And so running this, you know, fly OSU 686 two kilometers north of the NH line. This is translated into a topological constraint because we don't use metric constraints for this method. And what we see from this is that compared to not using topological constraints, our path is much closer to this expert defined path. And while it's not the same, it's still within the spirit of what the scientist is looking for. So this work that we have currently, we use these semantics as the interface between the human and the robot. 
And so we're able to generate these constraints from this uh, uh, method from language instructions. But what we're missing is that we don't define objective functions from this or invert this communication to allow the robot to communicate back to the human. And so in future work, this is what we're looking at. So like being able to define these objectives. So if you have multiple objectives you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at fish that you're trying to observe and then whales on the second uh, set of images here, how do you do compare between those two to get a useful utility function? And so what we're, uh, and this is really hard for users to define directly. So what we're proposing instead is allowing the user to select between different uh, pairs of paths and then just use this pairwise judgments in order to slowly build up a global utility function between those. And we have started work on this. And the second side of this is uh, transparency of the, the AI, of how can we invert this communication. And so taking insights from social sciences, we found that these explanations are typically termed in terms of alternatives. And then the second one is that we want to show like, what's different about the path that we're proposing that's from the other ones. And so we've already started looking at this. And the key insight here is once again using the semantic features as these interface. And so we use semantic features to describe these explanations. These explanations are termed in terms of the uh, alternatives. And then we select features to show for these explanations that are abnormal of what's different about this selected path. Uh, and so this is some future work that we're looking at. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah. Uh, for the path planning, do you care if it's the shortest path or not? Uh, not necessarily. So for the information gathering task, we're using um, an information gathering algorithm, which is thinking about the maximum budget that you have. So you always want to take that maximum budget, but uh, how do you select the path so that you can collect as much information as possible? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the difference between the topological relationship between paths and a metric relationship? Right. So topological would be uh, in terms of are you going to the north of some sort of object in the environment? Uh, and there's a lot of different places that you can move along there, versus metric would be more specifically saying, I need to go to is this exact waypoint or two kilometers north of this exact island. Okay. And the ladder is not we don't address this, and a lot of that is because natural languages, you don't usually say, go two kilometers exactly north of something. You say, oh, just go north of this area. Do you have any challenges with your synthetic data sets generation? Like, does it match what a person would actually say? Or? Yeah, that is a, a good question. And it matches relatively close. So it was taken from uh, gathering some instructions from people and then basically doing a, a large tree of switching in different phrases so it switches between the different features. Uh, did you get the commands uh, be like you type them into the robot or was this something that was verbal and then you turned the yeah, you can type them in as the current method. Uh, you could use some sort of like Alexa tool to get them, but we didn't look at that directly. How do you balance sort of like the robot's trying to reduce its own uncertainty about whatever experiment you're trying to do versus a person like saying, I want uncertainty reduced here? Is there like a decision making process on that point? It seems like a sliding scale, like one, you just like the robot does its own optimal thing, but others like the robot does what it's being told to do. Yeah, so I think this gets into that learning preferences that we talked about, or I talked just briefly mentioned. Uh, and so I would task that in sort of that problem of let the human pick what they want to do, because they're usually the ones that know better. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Great. Um, <laughs> the next speaker is uh, Rosario Bonatti. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rogerio Bonatti. I'm a researcher at Microsoft, and I'm going to present a paper that we submitted to IROS 22, which is called Reshaping Robot Trajectories Using Natural Language Commands, where we study multimodal data alignment using transformers. Uh, before I begin, I do want to thank all the collaborators that we had for this work at TU, uh, TU Munich and also at Microsoft, and especially the first author and student, uh, Arthur, who was responsible for most of this work. 
Uh, so the main goal of this uh, paper was on reshaping existing trajectories based on the context, uh, and especially user-informed context. Uh, there are many problems for which we are not just trying to go from point A, point a to point B with a robot, but we are trying to obey, uh, besides the geometrical constraints, also uh, con contextual constraints, and these come from a human. Uh, there are many types of interfaces that we can use to uh, express this communication between a human and a robot. Uh, we could use natural language, a mouse keyboard interface, you know, directly program the weights and cost functions, uh, make drawings with an iPad or with, a, with your mouse on a screen, uh, or even do kinesthetic teaching where you physically hold the robot uh, and, and show the desired path. Uh, each one of these interfaces has pros and cons. Uh, and you know, we can argue that, uh, and we argue in this paper, that natural language, uh, which is the way we communicate with other humans, is the most naturally, even though it's maybe not necessarily the most uh, technically easy way to uh, communicate with a, with a machine. Uh, one of the use cases that we, we uh, validate in this uh, work was the study of a robot barista. So this robot is trying to pour a glass of wine uh, to a uh, distressed researcher in the lab. <laughs> and uh, while doing that, it you know, knocks off this tower of crystal, but actually plastic glasses. <laughs> um, and what we would like to do is to have a sort of interface where you can express a command very naturally to the robot and say, you know, robot, stay further away from these glasses, and the robot can understand this instruction and apply this towards its motion. Uh, mathematically, we do have a few definitions here. Uh, we have a original trajectory, so we are, not, we are reshaping existing trajectory uh, that was generated by a, motion, a generic motion planning algorithm we're not necessarily creating this trajectory from scratch. Uh, so this original, tra original trajectory is, is designed as a, a collection of x, y waypoints in the scene. Uh, we have a bunch of objects in the environment. Uh, each object has a position and a semantic label. Uh, we have the user's natural language input, that's uh, L, and we are trying to learn the objective function F that maps the original trajectory, the user's language input, and the objects in the scene towards a modified, re uh, reshaped trajectory that obeys these geometrical and the context contextual constraints. Uh, in terms of the system overview, we want to be able to use arbitrary robotics platforms for this. Uh, we do assume that we have access to off-the-shelf object detectors uh, and also a generic motion planning system that comes up with this original trajectory that is geometrically feasible but that doesn't necessarily obey the user's uh, context. So the user's context comes in into our system and we output a new trajectory that you know, obeys both contextual and geometrical constraints, and we apply this to the robot using uh, inverse kinematics and the actuators. Uh, I'm going to talk about the technical challenges that you, you know, may imagine ex exist here. The first one is uh, on data generation. Uh, one uh, big assumption that we make here is that we can leverage large-scale uh, knowledge from existing large language models uh, to be able to extract information from the user's langu language input. So in models like GPT-3, BERT, or CLIP, we have uh, latent embeddings for uh, sentences for words, and we can make an assumption that if we have, let's say, a very small set of uh, synthetic vocabulary that was generated to train our system, we can assume, let's say, if we're trying to stay, away, stay far away from X or keep some distance from object X, we can assume that for unseen vocabulary, if we find uh, similar sentences like avoid being close to X or move away from X, uh, no, we, we can assume that these this, uh, embeddings are going to be very similar for both types of sen sentences, even though for those that were not seen in our training vocabulary. And this uh, has several advantages because you know, using these rich re representations, we can train the systems with much less data. Uh, we can have a much smaller set of uh, synthetic, synthetically generated vocabulary and still train effective systems. Uh, I won't go into the weeds of the procedural generation, but basically we have motion planning systems that we use to, to, to find the before and after trajectories after uh, inputting the, lang the user's uh, commands. Uh, as for the, the actual understanding of the, langu of the language, uh, we have a uh, model that has uh, kind of two main parts. The first one on the left is a, we use a pre-trained BERT encoder to find the meaning, the semantic meaning of the, uh, the user's language command. And we have a second uh, part of this contextual vector that is, is responsible for finding uh, which specific object in the scene 
is the uh, target object for the user's uh, language input, or potentially uh, multiple objects. Uh, here, we use a clip encoder to calculate a similarity matrix between the embedding that comes from the user's original language input and uh, each one of the objects in the scene. So if you say, uh, for example, stay away from the bottle, we want to be you know, staying away from the bottle and not the hammer or the apple that were also on the tabletop. And the reason why we use clip here is because in the future we want to be able to not just use you know, uh, the, the object labels like hammer, bottle, but actually the, just, just a picture of the, the tabletop. And uh, the way we combine this uh, semantic information together with the, you know, the, the actual uh, model that is going to output the, the final trajectories in the, in the XY space is by having this architecture here. So the first module on the left is the one I, I just explained uh, about the, 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 the semantic meaning. We fuse this information with a transformer encoder network that is extracting the geometrical context from the initial trajectory that we had and the poses of the, each one of the objects in the scene. And uh, this information is then passed on to a transformer decoder network. And you may see here, I know it's a lot of, we have a lot of diagrams on the screen, but this is, these diagrams are very similar to what we see in a uh, machine translation. So if we're trying to translate a sentence in English to German, it's very similar conceptually to, to what we're doing here. We're trying to translate a trajectory from the original uh, geometrical space into a different space that obeys not just the geometry, uh, constraints, but also the, the, the contextual information that the user gave us. Uh, we do output this trajectory one token at a time, so we, we are basically reconstructing the, the final trajectory by uh, predicting each waypoint one at a time. We did play around with trying to predict the, the trajectory at once, almost like a regression problem, but it turns out that the, uh, this architecture worked much better for this kind of problem. Uh, here you can see some results, uh, specifically on that robot barista problem. Uh, the original, tra original trajectory that the user saw you know, collides with the, the, the glasses, and if you tell the robot to stay away from the glasses, it's going to find a, a better path. And you can even inter interact with the system and send another, another language command, and the robot is going to execute an even better, better trajectory. Uh, we have many other results in the paper and ablations on uh, kind of uh, generic uh, 2D environments and uh, how, how the system executes in those. Uh, you can, the vocabulary is pretty weird because we were using uh, ImageNet labels, so uh, maybe later you can tell me what a Limpkin is, because I don't know. <laughs> we have other results that look at the intensity, so if you tell the robot to stay you know, much further away, a little bit further away, or closer, you know, a lot closer, uh, these are going to have different effects on the output trajectory. And we also do studies where we analyze using new vocabulary into the, the instructions. So vocabulary that, that was never seen during the training phase. Uh, we do a user study where we compare our interface directly with other types of interfaces, so kinesthetic teaching, uh, directly programming the computer and, and drawing on the screen. And we find uh, results that show that usually users can interact much faster uh, with the, the language interface. It produces trajectories that are more uh, feasible initially. Uh, very often we found that uh, with other interfaces, uh, the trajectories are not dynamically feasible by the robot, so the user has to interact multiple times with the system. Uh, yeah, so uh, with this, I just want to conclude. Uh, it, this you note, know, we have the code available uh, on GitHub if you want to take a look at this, uh, how we, how we uh, frame this problem. And I would be happy to take any questions if we do have a few minutes. We have time for one question. Alan? Yeah, so uh, very interesting. So one of your examples, you had an instruction even a bit further away. And that sounds like your model is taking into context of the session, the entire session. Conversation is that, is that true, or how is it doing that? So I think for that particular example, we uh, it was not taking the, the history of interactions. It was not taking into account the history of actions. It was taking the previous. So the initial guess for the trajectory uh, at the second step was the output of the first step. Uh, so, but yeah, we could design a system potentially that would take into, into account a history of interactions as a future work. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker.
The next presenter is Wentao Yuan from University of Washington. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wentao. And I'm excited to present our work, SORNET, Spatial Object-Centric Representation uh, for Sequential Manipulation. This is a uh, joint work with Karthik, Chris, and Dieter. So in sequential manipulation task, a robot needs to constantly reason about the spatial relations among different entities in the scene and plan its actions accordingly in order to achieve a desired goal. In the example shown here, uh, this is achieved by um, using a task and motion planner operating on top of a state estimator which output exact 60 poses of the object using 3D object models. Uh, we call this combination of state estimator and task and motion planner in the model-based approach. So they are widely adopted in robot manipulation literature because their effectiveness on real robots. These methods use handcrafted state representation that enables explicit reasoning about objects um, and also about the states, such as the object's 3D location or their orientation. However, estimating the handcrafted states often requires 3D object models or accurate object detection and segmentation, which limits the applicability of such methods uh, to a, usually a set of non-objects. An alternative to the model-based approach is the end-to-end -end approach, which also achieves a stream of success in robot manipulation. End-to-end -end methods avoid estimating explicit object states by learning an implicit representation from a raw sensor observations that is optimized directly to the end task. However, because um, there is no explicit notion of objects or object states, these methods lack the ability to st of structured reasoning. Uh, so it is difficult to deploy these learned policies on a task or goal not seen during training. You usually need to acquire additional training data or demonstrations. We would like to introduce a structured reasoning back into the learning process, and we believe the notion of objects plays an important role. Therefore, we propose a framework that learns a set of embedding vectors parameterized by object entities instead of a single representation for the entire scene. Our approach is explicit about objects, um, but implicit about the object state. In this work, we present initial evidences that this framework allows generalization to novel objects and novel tasks with little or no annotated data. Um, our idea of uh, this object uh, embedding is also inspired by recent works in visual question answering, but different from these pri um, prior works, we remove the dependence on object detection or segmentation and show applications on complex manipulation scenarios. We propose a framework for learning object-centric embeddings named SORNET, short for Spatial Object-Centric Representation Network. The input to SORNET is an RGB image plus a set of object queries um, represented by these canonical, what we call canonical object views. The RGB image and the canonical object views a pass-through embedding network, which produces an embedding vector for each of the query object. Then, a set of readout networks takes the object embedding and output logical states um, with the query objects as arguments. Note, uh, so these canonical object views, um, they did not need to match, actually, the pose of the object appearance do not need to match with what's in the scene. So if you execute in the real world, you can just take an image of um, these objects with your phone, and it will work on any um, scenes with these objects. So now, now take a look at uh, the architecture of the embedding network. The input to the embedding network is an RGB image plus the canonical object views. The input frame is first split into a set of patches, um, which form a sequence of patches together with the canonical object views. The sequence of image patches are then flattened and linearly, pro linearly projected onto a sequence of vectors. Uh, we then add positional encoding to the sequence, then encode it with a transformer 
cons consisting of multiple multi-head self-attention layers. Then we take the embedding from the final self-attention layer corresponding to the canonical object views as the, our output object embeddings. Our embedding network is based on the vision transformer backbone, which provides several nice properties. For example, we can change the number of object queries, or we can switch the order um, of the canonical object views, and the output embedding will change accordingly without uh, any modification to the network parameters. Although there is no explicit detection objective, the encoding network actually learns to implicitly encode object locations in the image. Here we visually uh, visualize the attention weights from each query object's token to the context patches. We can see that the patch containing the corresponding object is highlighted. Um, in addition, the network also pays attention to other important elements in the scene, such as the robot and any factor. To train these object embeddings, we leverage logical predicates from the task and motion planners. These logical predicates encode spatial relations among objects and the environment. For example, whether the robot is holding an object, or whether one object is stacked on top of another. Our network is not trained with any object mask, bonding boxes, or 60 poses. They're optimized directly to, predict, to predict these logical relationships. This allows the learned embedding to focus on inf information relevant to the spatial reasoning rather than being distracted by other factors. The logical predicates can be obtained from object embeddings using these readout networks, which are essentially a collection of two-layer perceptrons, each responsible for a type of spatial relation. Here, we show the operation of a unary readout network, which outputs um, predicates with a single object argument. The network maps the embedding of, um, say, the red block to the predicate with the red block as an argument and does the same for all the other object embeddings as well. There are also, um, we can also implement binary readout networks which and predict predicates with um, this pair of object as argument. And we can also do for the same for another pair of objects. Um, note that by using this kind of argument um, structure, um, the network output changes adaptively with the number of input object embedding. So if in test you only train on four objects in training, but in test time you, ha you want to ask about five objects, um, then the number of outputs of the network actually changes accordingly. You don't need to retrain the network. We can also train the, um, the readout networks not only to predict logical quantities, but also continuous quantities. For example, here we can um, train it to regress the XYZ uh, direction from the any factor to an object, uh, just the same as before for all of the uh, input object embeddings. So now let's look at some experimental results. We first evaluate SORNET um, on the task of classifying logical predicates from RGB frames. Um, let me play the videos. So um, we build a simulation data set where a robot arm performs sequential manipulation task uh, with domain randomization. Um, here we have a data set where the robot is manipulating a set of blocks. Um, there are complicated uh, stacking and unstacking tasks. Each scene um, involves like four to seven um, different colored blocks. We also tr um, train and test the network on um, this kitchen data set where it involves like a um, shelf and uh, more like common hold objects. And note that in both of the cases, um, the training set and test set con con consists of entirely different objects. Okay. Uh, so, here um, we show the results. Um, and the first question we ask is um, whether the embedding contains enough information to actually infer these spatial relationships. So we compare our network against uh, state-of-the-art uh, representation learning uh, techniques, such as CLIP, MVP, and R3M. Um, 
And we froze the embedding network weights and trained the readout network on a set of um, sequences, in including the test object. So in this case, we can see that although we um, train the baselines on this test object, they're unable to figure out the uh, relationships um, if the in, in, uh, embedding network is frozen. This essentially means that um, these popular methods um, not trained specifically in this robotic setting, uh, they do not contain these fine-grained uh, spatial relationships uh, information in order to do a manipulation task. And um, the next question we ask is um, whether the um, Thornet architecture is best um, to train these kind of spatial relationships. So in this case, we actually allow the embedding networks to fine tune themselves. Um, and we still like are outperforming uh, the baselines, which indicates that all this canonical view conditioning we're adding is necessary uh, in order to do this generalization to new objects. We also have um, results on real world as well. So uh, this is um, our lab setting and with some just object we grab from the kitchen and it can actually predict the um, correct predicates. Even for example, in this scene, there are a lot of uh, distractor objects. So I think I'm almost out of time. So let me skip these results. So another thing uh, we have shown is, in addition to predict uh, logical predicates, Stornet is also able to predict continuous vectors from any vector to the object. So this um, potentially enables application, for example, uh, visual surveying. Um, you can use Stornet to directly control robot to reach an uh, object you want. I'll take any questions. Yeah. So let's thank the speaker because we are running out of time. So we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. <laughs> next speaker is Alan Fawn from Oregon State. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm Alan Fern from Oregon State. This was an ICRA 2021 uh, paper, uh, two student uh, first authors. And since we're going to have uh, several uh, talks from our lab, I wanted to introduce the lab. So we're the Dynamics, Dynamic Robotics Lab at Oregon State. Uh, Jonathan Hurst and I uh, co-direct it. Bunch of students, sorry, a few of them, uh, they're all here. A few are here that are not on the uh, slide yet. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, collaborators from Agility. These are three that uh, were very influential to, to getting us to where we are now. We have a robot, and the robot's right out there. Uh, Cassie is our robot. Uh, here are the basic stats. Uh, we've had Cassie uh, running up to four meters per second uh, recently. Uh, and basically, what we've been working on for the last several years is blind walking. So, so if we had time, I'd have you all stand up, close your eyes, and walk around. And you know, most of you would not fall down. You'd be able to, I, I could even have you skip and hop and you would not fall down. Humans are very reliable blind walkers and we want Cassie to get the same capabilities as humans. That's the goal. And the way that uh, this looks is since Cassie's blind, we need to input the uh, control via some remote control and we specify the desired speed heading, desired gate, that's going to be a, you know, how do we do that? That's going to be one of the contributions here. And what Cassie uh, sees for input is just proprioceptive inputs, you know, the, the velocities and positions of the joints. And based on that, we have to output 10 uh, torques uh, to the motors, five for each leg. How do we do this? Well, our lab is, is exploring the limits of sim to real reinforcement learning for this problem. We've looked at this for several years now. And this means that uh, we're going to learn in simulation based on some reward signal. And that reward signal needs to tell us uh, how well we're matching the uh, remote control input. How well is Cassie doing what we want it to do? And the key question that really stumped us for quite a while is how do we specify a, a desired gate? Um, you know, what, what I'm going to show you first is just the architecture and our original uh, specification of gates was just trajectories that we input somehow. So, you know, and that's the, the obvious thing that you would do. 
Well, let's look at the architecture first. So, so basically uh, what we have is uh, a neural network that's the main control element, and that's given a state estimation uh, from uh, the raw sensor readings. And this neural network's operating at 40 hertz. You know, it's too slow for, for actual actuations. And because of that, it's just outputting PD set points, uh, which are fed into a PD controller, which operates at 2 kilohertz. And that's the basic loop. So the neural network's sort of isolated from the, uh, the raw signals and the raw actuations by the state estimator and the PD controller. And we want to train in simulation and then transfer to the real robot, which, you know, at first we, we had no idea whether this could actually work or not. Uh, and what we found is that it's a very powerful combination using domain randomization, randomized things like friction, center of mass in the simulator, and a recurrent memory network, which uh, allows the network to sort of learn a state representation for the robot that takes into account some of the, uh, the physical environment factors that we're randomizing, and then decide on the policy based on that. Now, uh, just to show you what uh, domain randomization uh, buys you, this is when you train in simulation without domain randomization. You would not bet your money that the robot's going to uh, remain standing, uh, as opposed to uh, if you train with domain randomization, you might be more inclined to bet some money that the robot's going to remain standing. So this was a pretty, uh, pretty nice uh, early result. Uh, here we were training this robot with uh, trajectories that were sort of pre-recorded, and so that's partly why the motions don't look so pleasing, but, uh, but it was a pretty nice result early on. Now, that gets kind of boring, just having a robot walking, and so we want to do things like this. This guy's jumping, this bird is hopping. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we'd like Cassie to do that uh, is more than walking. And, you know, we, we would even like Cassie to do skipping, you know, like this guy. Sometimes humans skip when they're, they're happy or they're, they're told to in gym class, I guess. So how do we do that? That, that, that really uh, stumped us for quite a while. So there's this whole space of uh, bipedal gates, and, and there's a continuum here, really, walking, hopping, galloping, skipping, standing even. We consider standing to be a gate. Uh, how can we describe this gate with, with a small number of dials uh, so we can control it from a remote control? And also, we want that description to be translated into a reward function that can be trained in simulation, right? So we can turn the dials in simulation, and then uh, if we have the dials in a skipping position, we want Cassie to eventually learn to skip. So how can we do this? Well, to, to show, this is the main contribution of the paper. Um, and to show you the idea, it, we're going to look at this very simple unipedal hopper. So we want to get a hopping motion, we'll say, with just, uh, just one leg. Uh, you can ask, well, you could try to input a uh, motion trajectory and try to force the robot to mimic it. That's not very robust because uh, you might want to depart a little bit from the trajectory and what are the trade-offs. So instead you might say, well, what are some of the fundamental properties of these trajectories? that will be sufficient statistics to essentially define the trajectory once you match those properties. And if you look here, you could look at the force, right? One of the fundamental properties is when the aerial phase is in play, there's no force on the foot, right? So zero force. When you're on the ground, the force is non-zero, right? So, so you could think that that's a fundamental property. Uh, you could look at the velocity. It's the opposite relationship. When you're in the aerial phase, the velocity of the foot is non-zero. When you're on the ground, the velocity of the foot is zero. And somewhat surprisingly, if you just look at the different gates and you say, well, what are the non-zero forces, the times of the non-zero forces and the times of the zero forces, and same with velocities, you can specify all the gates, more or less. And the question is, if you just train to try to match those non-zero forces and zero forces, uh, will it result in the gates that you want? And so uh, what that looks like if you turn it into a reward signal is we have a clock going into the controller, and at the different phases, uh, you can say, well, there's going to be a cost modulation here, a negative cost modulation for force during the swing phase, and here for velocity, there's a no cost at all for, uh, for the velocity um, during the swing phase. So you can, you know, you can 
think, of, think on your own how you can put these all together. But uh, the end result is we have these waveforms, one for each leg and for velocity and, and, uh, and force, that we input into the network. And we can control the waveforms by the ratio of the, uh, you know, the swing to ground phase and the offset of these different uh, waveforms of the different legs. And you can get all sorts of uh, different uh, behaviors this way. And we, we don't do anything fancy from an RL point of view. We just have the domain randomization with PPO training and lots and lots of training. So hundreds of millions of, uh, of uh, time steps uh, in training. So it's kind of brute force RL, nothing fancy there. Um, so if you do this, you can see here, uh, here's a waveform, uh, it's symmetric for each leg. I'm just showing the force waveform. And you get hopping, right? We were pretty surprised to see that this actually works. So this had been trained in simulation for 100 million iterations, we'll say. And uh, you get hopping. Now if you uh, offset the waveforms, turn the dial, offset the waveforms a little bit, you get walking. Right? And if, if you change it a little bit more and you had a double aerial phase, you would get running. I'm not going to show you running here, but uh, here's a fun one. So if you uh, have a two hop clock cycle, you can actually specify skipping. So, so Cassie is happily skipping here. Uh, I don't think we'll have Cassie skipping today. That's a little, little too uh, high momentum for, for an audience. But, uh, but Cassie can skip inside and outside and and you can even, uh, by turning these dials, you see Jonah here with the joystick, you can go from running, this is slow motion, to skipping, just by turning the dials. So, I mean, I was at least very surprised to see this actually work. Um, and so, so I it kind of formed a new appreciation of sim to real uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and so that's mainly uh, what I wanted to tell you today. And... You know, we started, we, we really didn't know if sim to real was going to have a shot. And so does it work in the real world? Well, I, you know, I think brute force RL works surprisingly well for, for at least this setting. And, and I, you see it more and more um, in other settings. And I, I think, of course, it does have its limits. And we're sort of hitting some of the limits in some places. And you'll see some of them in later talks. And I think that's really one of the more interesting uh, frontiers. So then how do you integrate real data you know, after you've done your sim to real. And that's all I have. I'll thank the sponsors. And uh, if we have time for questions, I'll take questions. Uh, let's take one question. Uh, so for the randomization, how did you decide how much randomization to use? Yeah, I'd say that's not, there's no science behind that. Uh, students play around for a while and try to use the minimal amount that you need. Um, yeah, no science yet. That's actually an interesting question. Yeah. Cool. Let's thank the speaker. The next speaker is Jeremy Dow from Oregon State. OK, cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Dow. I'm a PhD student at Oregon State University uh, under Dr. Fern, also part of the Dynamics Robotics Laboratory. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about our work on sim to real learning for bipedal locomotion under unsensed dynamic loads. Uh, so in order for robots to be practical and useful in the real world, we would really like them to be able to interact with the environment around them. And so this might include you know, being able to locomote while carrying a variety of different loads. And it's important to note that the loads that we would be mainly concerned with are dynamic loads, which can have their sort of own internal dynamics that can have effects even if the robot is stationary. And so this would require being able to control some sort of like external object via the locomotion gate itself. And so some examples of this are you know, maybe some waiter carrying a cup on a tray or uh, a carrying pole that has you know, two swinging weights on each end. And uh, ideally, all of this could be done without additional sensing so that different loads could be very easily switched out on the fly. And um, previous work, uh, we were very surprised to find that no one has really tackled this yet. And so previous work has really focused mainly on handling static loads, like rigid, uh, fixed rigid attached masses, or sort of largely separate out these two, the manipulation from the locomotion problem, such as walking up to some obstacle, stopping, moving it out of the way, and then continuing to walk again. And so uh, as 
you know, Dr. Fern talked about, reinforcement learning has really enabled high-performance locomotion gates uh, for Cassie so far. Um, you know, being able to run a 5K robustly outside, and we've just gotten great results with it. And so we would, you know, wonder if we could use these same techniques uh, for a very similar task of learning to locomote with loads. Um, so, you know, Alan already talked about this, so I'll kind of just briefly skip over, you know, some of the details of learning, but uh, as Alan said, we can choose to describe walking as sort of this alternating cycle of having your foot in swing or stance, sort of as having the foot in the air or on the ground. Um, and by, you know, setting up these timings in the right way, we can define walking or running or any other kind of bipedal gait that, uh, you know, Alan talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, we can use that framework to learn general basic locomotion policies for un like an unloaded CASI. And so in this work, we want to target uh, a number of different loaded models. Uh, so here, starting on the left, we have the base CASI model. And then we have what we call the CASI tray box model, which consists of a freely moving five kilogram box uh, on top of a tray that's usually attached to pelvis. And then we have the uh, CASI cart model, where there's a cart attached with ropes that CASI has to pull along the ground. And then we have the most difficult case that we call the CASI carrying pole, where um, two five kilogram swinging weights are attached on either end of this fixed rigid pole. And uh, we like to note that Cassie's around 30 kilograms. Uh, so in this case, Cassie has to carry about a third of its own body weight. And the uh, swinging masses uh, make for like really hard dynamics that, that are hard to stabilize. And then lastly, we have a Cassie water jug, which consists of a box that's rigidly attached again to Cassie with some water inside that we just sort of approximate with some springs. And so as expected, if you just, you know, apply normal lo locomotion policies to these, they're just going to fail immediately, right? Like, th this is way harder cases. They've never seen this before. They're going to fail. Um, but we find that simply just training in the context of each load is enough to learn successful policies, and there's no additional sensing required. Um, so everything about the learning setup, the algorithm, the hyperparameters, reward function, those are all the same as Alan described earlier, and the same things that we use for the unloaded case. Um, there is a small exception for the tray box model that you see here on the very left. Um, in this case, there's this like, additional goal of keeping the box on top of the tray, so we have an extra reward term to keep the box in the center of the tray, and a uh, termination condition if the box falls off. And so just using dynamics randomization, we were able to transfer all of these policies to the physical hardware, and the policies were able to walk uh, stably for over a minute without falling. And even in the very difficult case of the, the carrying pole, policies are still able to uh, successfully transfer. Um, and I'd like, like to emphasize how you know, difficult this is. Like if you, you know, close your eyes and hold your arms in and you know, we attach to your waist you know, some swing in mass and you try to walk, it's, it's difficult. So um, if you, know, so you see Cassie walking a little drunkenly, um, you know, give, it, give it a pass. It, it's harder than it looks. Um, we were also able to uh, bootstrap load-specific policies from a pre-trained unloaded policy. And, and doing this, you know, we're able to save hundreds of millions of samples in order to reach the same reward in simulation. Um, and so, you know, since in every case the goal is still to walk forward, it kind of makes sense that um, having this expert walking policy would still contain, you know, very useful information that would still apply to the, the load policies, uh, and that we can use that to quickly generalize uh, and learn a very similar walking task. Um, furthermore, we're also able to learn a general load policy that's capable of handling all five loads. So this policy is uh, trained in the exact same way. It just sees uh, all models doing training. Um, and so it's sort of reasonable to assume that the skills that you would need to handle one load can be very easily applied to a different load and that you would need sort of very similar sorts of stabilizing minimal movement gates uh, no matter what the load is. And so these two experiments shown here are using the exact same policy. And you know, this might indicate that there's some sort of general load robustness skill that can be learned. Um, however, despite successful hard, uh, hardware performance, we find that adding in these dynamic loads significantly widens the sim to real gap. And so all of the load policies reach significantly lower top speeds on hardware than we can do in simulation. Um, so for example, you see here in, the, in uh, the tray box case, on hardware we can only walk about half as fast before it gets too bumpy and the box falls off. Uh, and similarly, in the carry pole, we can reach only about like a third of the simulation top speed, like 0.8 meters a second compared to uh, 2.5 in simulation. And so it's reasonable to assume that adding in dynamic loads is going to widen this sim to real gap, 
because uh, you have more moving bodies to account for and more complex you know, dynamics to model, all of which are going to increase your margin of error in the simulation. And so the deficiencies that we see here in the hardware performance um, that we experience, we think kind of indicate that the canonical solution of sim to wheel of dynamics randomization is perhaps not quite enough. And we're starting to you know, push the limits here. And so this you know, might indicate that we need to do further research into crossing this sim to wheel gap. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah, so this is using the exact same framework that uh, Alan showed earlier. It's yeah, still using PPO, still using uh, LSTMs. Uh, we have tried using SAC, uh, and not specifically on these load cases, but on like the general walking case, and, and that works fine as well. Yeah. Yeah. How much do your policies end up varying over like the time scale of multiple gates? I mean, it seems like you would have like a theoretical policy for accelerating than theoretical policy for like steady state. Is that something that you see or would that help? Um, yeah, so I think that's sort of inherent in the policy. Like they're not explicitly separate policies, um, but particularly because they're sort of memory-based policies, when they're seeing different sequences of states, the behavior will be different. So you definitely see, um, at least in simulation where things are very controlled, you'll see it fall into roughly the same kind of cycle every time, um, no matter you know what starting position you put it in. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you have any intuition for what the policies are doing differently um, when you apply a load like a dynamic load like this? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'd love to point you to the paper. We do a little bit of hypotheses about that. So you can see um, for the tray box, it's trying to keep really stable. So it sort of has a very uh, narrow footstep to try and not sway a bunch to keep the box stable. And then you sort of see the opposite effect for the carrying pole because it has to like absorb all of these swings. It sort of takes much larger side-to-side -side footsteps, uh, which was very interesting. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, for the water jump model, did you look at all if it had an open top and trying to keep it from swash out? Is that be similar to the tray box? Or? Yeah, um, we didn't look at that. We just wanted to kind of have the dynamics of you know this momentum thing so we just had a mass in there on a spring just to sort of approximate having water in there um, yeah go ahead uh, what was your reward signal was it just based on distance or did you also reward like how it would prevent tipping over or? yeah so the reward signal is um the same as you know alan mentioned earlier we have you know those descriptions on the foot and then a couple like smoothing heuristics and the main goal is trying to match some commanded speed some like other functions in there for like tilting or balance? Um, yeah, we have a desired orientation and then balance is just like if you fall down, you, the trajectory ends, you get no more rewards. So there's this kind of inherent thing in there. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so it seems that you're using the Mojo Go simulator for a lot of these stuff. The way it does for contact dynamics is very approximate <coughs> and like, takes the speed trade off versus the accuracy trade off. So, do you foresee, like, do you have a future that that was done better, so would these tasks would be easier or would generalize better, or like that under way randomization has seen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, we definitely starting to wonder if how much of our issues is that the model is wrong or that the model is not enough. So, we might need to like, have some residual model to you know, better account for the actual contact dynamics because I think that's definitely one of the biggest areas where you would end up getting mismatch. Cool. Let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Ashish Kapoor from Microsoft Research. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so this is uh, primarily work done by uh, Wen Hao Luo when he was an intern with us, uh, I think a year ago, and Wen Sun, who was a postdoc at Microsoft Research Cambridge. And uh, this is about sample efficient, safe learning on online nonlinear controls. So let's uh, let's see what's about. All right. So you know, um, so our team is autonomous systems research group, and safety is one of the things that we are very interested in. And uh, more and more robots are being trained with reinforcement learning. So consequently, the natural question to ask is, you know, what if we had some safety constraints? 
how can those safety constraints help um, uh, you know help us not get into trouble while we're doing reinforcement learning so for instance here what i'm showing you is an inverted pendulum right i mean you know a very simple example um, and this is being learned using a model based rl method and this model based rl method um, you know this is a william say all but recently they have been some some innovations theoretically in these algorithms where you can actually talk about sample efficiency so if you are if you're familiar with reinforcement learning sample efficiency is one of the key questions that a lot of folks are asking so for instance you know a recently an, uh, an algorithm from again folks at microsoft research cambridge was lc3 um, you know basically lower confidence based um, uh, you know continuous control and uh, they are using some of uh, you know some of the methodologies from 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 banded lit literature to prove that you can get a regret bound that square that that goes as square root t right but the problem with those algorithms is that they are not taking into account some of these safety considerations so for instance imagine the same problem but here my constraint is that you do not ever hit this uh, this this blue rod maybe because this blue rod is supporting this uh, you know uh, this this pendulum so can you still efficiently learn a policy without violating such constraints right um so constraints are very deterministic here i mean these are like you know conditions that you can write as uh, for instance a convex set right so but that's the idea and the question that we are asking is can you then find a sample efficient rl policy that wouldn't violate constraints and again um, you know this is in this in this in the realm of model based reinforcement learning so we are trying to approximate dynamics of the system as well right so just to just to give you give you a sense um so this work was i didn't tell where the, uh, you know the venue of this work so this work was recently accepted to wafer so a lot of discussion here is algorithmic and i am happy to discuss uh, offline if some of these things are not clear but unlike the previous presentations i don't have very cool demos except some of these kinds of uh, uh, videos all right so let's uh, you know let's get into the challenges some of the challenges are first thing is guaranteeing safety you know guaranteeing safety specifically in the realm of rl is extremely difficult so how can we do that so that's the one one of the first things um the second thing is uh, you know um efficiency i told you about that we are looking at square root t regret bounds can we still mention those and finally i didn't even talk about the task i also want to make progress towards the task so there are three things we are trying to achieve using the same algorithm uh, safety sample efficiency as well as meaningful uh, progress towards towards the goal right and so you know that's the contribution and you know theoretically um, what we are showing is that those square root t guarantees that i was talking about the regret that, that i was going to talk about we can actually have a way of using some primitives called control barrier functions to you know to um, to sort of wrap your algorithm around and then still preserve those efficiency guarantees if you are familiar with control barrier certificates I mean, the whole goal is that these are mathematical constructs that allow you to um, you know, to incorporate the dynamics of your system in this case this dynamics is still unknown right so that's the, that's the tricky part so such that your safety guarantees are uh, you know th they are forward invariant as in that you can actually guarantee safety considering your current state as well as the dynamics of the system right so that's the that's a that's the idea all right so let me graphically depict how this algorithm works you know the algorithm is fairly straightforward but let me just go through it so again let's consider the example of uh, of inverted pendulum so the inverted pendulum as i said this is model based so consequently we are modeling the dynamics of the system in this case we are modeling the dynamic of the system using a gaussian process so what we got we got you know this graph showing our dynamic model so as in at a given angle if you apply a torque what's the new angle going to be and you represent that as a gp right um you start with some reasonable approximation again you know that's that's uh, that's one of the things that that you got to this, these are you know prior assumptions so um, imagine you have some some reasonable assumption of of your model so this model is represented as a mean and a covariance function around it and given that you use lcb like mechanism to sample you know one possible dynamic and then you do 
and MPC over it, right? So that's the part of LC3. So LC3 works like that. What LC3 does is basically giving a distribution over, over your model dynamics, you sample one, and then you, and you sample according to the LCB policy, and then you, and you plan. Once you do, once you do these kinds of planning, you got to again now figure out that the, the policy uh, that, that wants to take an action, is it safe or not? And that's where your safety barrier certificates come. So what I'm showing you is a feasible space, right? And this feasible space is basically a convex space in this case, you know, for instance. And most of the, most, you know, most of the constraints that we're looking at are in the, in, in the same domain. Again, given this feasible space, you can use the constructs, the mechanisms by safety barrier certificates to reason about what are the feasible set of controls which are safe. And this is an, again a con convex program. Um, I'm happy to you know, share the details, but what you are essentially doing is you have a policy and you look at the control coming out of that policy and you minimally perturb it such that that perturbation guarantees you that you say in the feasible set. That's all is happening, right? And you take that action, right? And you collect data. As you take this action, you collect more data and then you can update your, you know, your, uh, 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 your model now. So that's basically the loop. Right? The first part of the loop is L3C. The feasibility is safety bar certificate. A lot of work in this, um, you know, a, a lot of effort in this work was really trying to prove that these regret bounds transfer over whenever you're using CBFs as well. Right? So that's the core contribution, that's the core theorem. We do have some experiments, but basically they are highlighting the, the, the theoretical foundation of this work. Right? So, um, Again, uh, you know, I can you can keep you can keep doing this. I think the um, animations here, right? As you as you learn more and more, you find that you can actually achieve reasonable performance on the task while staying safe with a uh, uh, with, with the regret bound, which is a square root of t, right? Um, you know, in the interest of time, I won't get into the details here. There. You know, you can apply the same principles, not to just pendulums, but to any robots, right? So as long as, as I, as I said, right, um, you have some initial, some, A, definition of safety, right? That's one of the things that we always uh, slip under the rug. You've got to be able to define safety. Um, a reasonable, I would say, model dynamic. You know, again, this is using Gaussian process, so we are not assuming any kind of linearity. You can have actually nonlinear dynamics as well, right? And, uh, um, Right, uh, and and you know of course some reasonable definition of reward. So let me just uh, show you some some results. So here, okay. So here here you know, so the primary robots that we work with in our group are aerial robots. So imagine if you have a wind field which is unknown to you, and you have to go from one location to another location, right? So you know you can assume no wind and plan for it, right? So this is again without any obstacle. Other, or you can assume ground truth and pl plan for it. So on the left is what you're seeing is optimal, and on the right is basically, you know, you are doing some kind of a model-based uh, uh, model reinforcement learning. Um, same thing, you know, you can actually do it with our method or with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, another baseline, which is basically, you know, using some kind of a CBF with an alternate uh, uh, model-based control. And, you know, we, we can prove that we are, f not prove, I mean empirically find that we are fairly, fairly close, to, uh, close to the optimal trajectory. But the interesting thing happens when you have obstacles, right? When you have obstacles, our ability to, to reason about the dynamics of the system while staying safe is, uh, is what this work is really all about, right? So I heard the buzzer, so I'm not sure if I'm out of time, but uh, let me just, you know, stop here with this, uh, Again, depiction. So here what I'm trying to do is doing the same inverted pendulum, but the safety constraint here is that you are never supposed to be in that blue region. So can you then still uh, learn a policy starting from scratch, assuming no dynamics, it's a model-based policy again, right, while staying efficient? And, uh, you know, basically, uh, let me see. I mean, you know, the testing episode is where you stop the model learning, and you actually can, you know, still still achieve target while staying safe and while learning efficiently. So with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. We yeah. have time for one question. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, at test or at runtime or test time, inference time, um, are the 
control barrier functions active or are there insurance? Yes, yes, they are active always. So the control barrier function is kind of a wrapper sitting over your policy. So your policy gives you a control and then you reason about whether this, yes. That's the only mechanism that guarantees safety. Otherwise, the policy itself does not, we cannot reason about the policy, right? So if you want to guarantee pilot policy, you've got to have this mathematical construct sitting over your, uh, your neural networks or, you know, in this case, uh, leaner controllers. All right. Thank you, everyone. The next speaker is Sai Vampralla from Microsoft. Uh, so I'm Sai Vampralla from the Autonomous Systems Group at Microsoft, and I'm here to talk about our recent work on representation learning for sort of like using policies and reinforcement learning with event-based cameras. So this work was done in collaboration like with, uh, with Sammy Mian, who was an intern with us last year from the University of Pittsburgh, and this was presented in Europe last year as well. All right, so the main motivation of this work, I would say, is our interest in sort of like, you know, how do we control robots with like low control latency, right? So if you think about, for instance, drones that are flying aggressively, and here is a quick example of drone racing, which is a really uh, fast, agile kind of like drone flight that you typically see, um, the robot navigation in general is a very fast perception action loop, right? So we are uh, possibly looking at hundreds of hertz, like typically drones operate at about 200 to 400 hertz at the motor level. So if you're looking to control drones and if you want to like, execute really uh, agile maneuvers, we have to be able to control them at some, uh, something like that. Whereas, so one thing we can think about is obviously when we think about control, we can always say, okay, I'm going to try to optimize, for example, uh, the performance of my algorithms and you know, uh, increase the amount of compute that I have on board and things like that. But there is one other s side to this question, which is really about perception. Like, how do we actually speed up perception from the sensing's point of view? So if you look at typical cameras, they often operate at like 30 to 60 hertz, and there are some embedded cameras which are probably, you know, uh, you know 100 hertz or something like that. But really, is there anything more we can do on the sensing side? And if you think about the question a little bit more, and if we get some inspiration from biology, um, so there is a, a hypothesis that you know, human behavior is composed of two systems. One of them is thinking fast and the other one is thinking slow, according to uh, Daniel Kahneman's theory. So if you dis divide behavior into two kinds, so one of them is reactive, which is really about fast actions and you know, just getting like, the basic sense of what's happening around you and taking a quick action that you know, can mitigate danger or something like that. And then the other one would be deliberative. So the differences between these two are like reactive behavior will tell you um, you know, about the very basic context of what's happening around you. For instance, all you need to know if you have to avoid an obstacle is that there is an object somewhere to my left or to my right or something like that. You don't really care about things like the texture, the color, and things like that about the object for simple obstacle avoidance. So, and here is actually a, an example from a uh, biology paper where they're trying to look at the, um, the optic nerve spike train of a crab. So they're trying to like, move an object in front, of, in front of its field of view, and they're trying to observe how does the spike train change in the optic nerve. And you can see that there is a very minimal kind of representation that's going to its brain. It's not really concerned with the shape of the object all that much or the color or anything like that. And you know, typically, that's what we do observe at the lowest level of vision. So inspired by this, there has been um, advances in the sensing side with the development of, with the development of an, something called an event camera. And the event camera is very different from our typical cameras in the sense that it generates asynchronous events at a very fast rate. So instead of normal cameras, which typically capture frames, as you see, like RGB frames of something going on, event cameras actually only capture events where things are changing. So they're only looking at, for example, changes in the logarithmic brightness of the scene. So there's more that goes into the event camera model, but really um, you know, the key thing here is that it's streaming these events as a stream of bytes, uh, typically at, you know, at like a megahertz scale. So it's extremely fast, and the data is very minimal. It only shows you if the, inc if the brightness at a given pixel is increasing or decreasing. So um, yeah, the raw output of an event camera is really what's called a, stream, a byte stream, the stream of events. So each event actually records a timestamp and the location of the pixel at which you know, this delta brightness is happening. And then there's something called a polarity, which tells you if it's like increasing or decreasing. So it's either plus one or minus one. So you can see it's like a very minimal uh, representation of data. So there are challenges if you want to operate upon such fast um, you know, data streams, right? I mean, sure, it gives us the advantage of like, being able to operate things at a very low latency. But how do we deal with such fast data? For instance, if you think about typical computer vision algorithms, at least in the machine learning side, uh, we are often concerned with frames that are coming in at a slow rate. We don't really know how to you know, properly deal with asynchronous fast data. 
So um, those are some of the challenges that you know, we think about when we think about event cameras. So the contributions of our work are really how do we adapt typical representation learning approaches to sort of encode some kind of a context from these asynchronous streams of data. So for that, we propose what we call an event variational autoencoder, and I'll uh, get into a little bit more detail on that. And we show that these representations are actually robust to sparseness of the data, especially because these cameras are so fast that sometimes, I mean, and they're so minimal, right? So sometimes you'll have to handle really sparse streams of data and still get inf enough information about, say, like obstacles or something like that. And there's another interesting uh, advantage that we show that's about domain gap, and I'll get into more detail on that. And as the next part of this paper, we also show that we can use these representations to do reinforcement learning or some kind of a policy learning in the future. Uh, and we show that because um, you know, the, the main motivation was to sort of adapt to fast event streams, right? So we will show that we can control robots at, a, at like high control capacities and so on. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the model architecture. A lot of details are in the paper. I'm happy to sync up offline as well. But really, the key thing we wanted to show here is that uh, some, of, some of the approaches in the event camera space typically tend to look at events and then squash them into, say, a frame. Because you know we are more used to frames in the computer vision point of view. So if you want to use like convolution neural nets or something, you would want to just look at frame-based data. But instead, we propose actually looking at the byte stream as a byte stream. So what we do is we have a, uh, you know, there's a raw byte stream of like some arbitrary length, right? We don't, we can't really be sure how many events will stream in a given window of time. So we will actually compute features for each of those events using a point net style architecture. This is something that's typically used for point cloud learning. But we have to note that there's also a timestamp. So it's not just the points, right? So we have to find a way to sort of encode the uh, the meaning of time. So we get inspiration from transformers here. So we compute a sinusoidal positional uh, embedding sort of a thing for the timestamps. So when we combine both of those, what we end up getting are a set of spatial features and a set of temporal features. So again, following point net to some extent, uh, we actually sort of like do a maxwell operation, which results in a context feature is what we call it, which is really describing what has happened in the world across this window of time that I'm looking at. So, and then those are propagated through a typical uh, VAE kind of an architecture. And um, what we try to do is we actually look at these streams of events and then we try to predict, okay, what would the image, the squashed image that I just described look like? And that's what you know uh, the network sort of uses to make sure that it's encoding the right features. So one, one quick thing that we observe here is that we can actually create pretty good representations of event data, at least in, in like the, the minimal sense of what we call context. So for instance, on the right, there's a picture that's showing. Uh, so in the picture, like on the left, what we have is the locations of the events that are being streamed. So if you look at, for example, five milliseconds versus 50 milliseconds or something like that, obviously five milliseconds would have a lot lesser number of events, right? But on the right, in the blue-green sort of a thing, we are showing the reconstruction from the network. So it's trying to look at the square-shaped object, but even with a very low number of events, it's already sort of able to determine, oh, I'm looking at, like, this is a drone gate, right? So that's one of the advantages we get, because um, it's able to handle sparse sort of sequences. And, um, and yeah, so um, looking at like original sort of like event streams here, we're also able to see like, okay, we can decode what the object looks like, even with very small number of events. So that will help you do obstacle avoidance, or we are also interested in things like drone racing. So looking at drone gates from event streams and things like that. And so quickly, I also want to go through the, uh, the part of work where we did the actual perception action loop. So we do reinforcement learning on top of these representations as well. So it's actually fairly um, straightforward because we have the latent vectors coming from our event VAE, so we train like a PPO-based uh, policy on top of it. Uh, this is all set up in Microsoft AirSim, which contains an event simulator. So if you have, take like sequence, sorry, sequential RGB frames and you predict the events out of them. So we do see a couple of uh, things here. The first thing is that the training uh, is usually kind of faster because of lower sample complexity. Obviously, because it's in uh, like a condensed kind of a space, it's an easier feature to sort of understand. But we also see that these event-based policies are actually faster to train than even VAEs coming from RGBs. So there's, uh, you know, there's more minimal amount of data that you need to achieve tasks often. And we do see that we can control drones up to like 200 to 400 hertz. So the dots in like the orange and blue are the ones that are the performance of the event stream policies. And then we see that the uh, performance of like RGB-based policies, uh, sorry, uh, image-based policies actually drops fairly quickly if you, if you go to the high control frequencies. And the most interesting results, I would say, are the robustness of these policies to 
changes in texture and shape of the obstacles. So I started the presentation by saying, okay, there is something magical about the minimal representations that we have for, uh, for this you know, reactive behavior. Right? That's exactly what we see here. So even if we change the texture, even if we change the shape, uh, it generalizes like out of the box because it doesn't really care about any of those uh, properties of obstacles. So this says that you know, event cameras are really interesting if you want to like, reduce domain gap uh, fairly easily. So we train a policy on um, you know, like the wooden poles kind of an environment that we show in the top right, but it adapts like right away to completely different textures, completely different sort of environments. So yeah, that's, and even with like fancy moving sort of lights on the obstacle and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a lot more robust. And our method is also shown to be a lot more robust than the methods that try to squash events into frames. So on the right, we show the, you know, the CNN that's operating on like squashed image frames of events. On the left, we have our event BAE based policy, which is, uh, which has like a higher success rate. So yeah, um, I think I'm probably out of time. So that's basically the crux of our work. Um, so the representation learning and reinforcement learning are possible with event cameras. And we do show a couple of, um, uh, you know, some gains in the performance and all this and specifically robustness, which opens up uh, you know, research into how do we, you know, train on like more diverse data sets and how do we achieve more tasks with these event cameras. And the code and the data are actually available on GitHub. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look at our paper and the code. So thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll skip the questions. So we'll, we'll have the next speaker, Michael Liu from Simon Fraser. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Michael, a PhD student at Simon Fraser University. Today, I'll be pre presenting on behalf of my lab member, Payam Nadels, on his recent work, LBGP, Learning Based Goal Planning for Autonomous Following in Front. This was published at ICRA 21 and was in collaboration with Richard Vaughn and Mo Chen. In this problem, in this paper, we work on the problem of, of a mobile robot trying to stay ahead of a human while following them. In contrast to an easier problem, of following from behind. This, this is a much more challenging task because the robot, while it still needs to predict where the human has to, where the human is going to go, it must also find a feasible and safe way of staying ahead of them. This application can be fit in in many tasks, such as a guide dog where it's useful, or a robot guide dog where it's useful to be in front of a human, as well as for a tournament case case because having a suitcase follow in front of you could deter thieves from stealing it. Uh, in our previous work for following in front, we presented an extended Kalman filter approach. In that work, EKF predicts the position of a person, and then a human motion model also accounts for obstacles in the environment. And then um, a planner is then used to, pr to move the rod to in front of the human. To the best of our knowledge, this system was the state of the art for staying in front for staying in front tasks for unmanned ground vehicles. The contributions of our paper are the following. Firstly, we demonstrate the, that the policy trained using our method can be trained, can be directly transferred into the real world without any retraining. Secondly, we improve the safety and generalizability of our system by combining a robotic trajectory planner and deep RL. Using curriculum learning, we can decrease the training time while also improving the final return. Finally, we evaluate our system in simulation using Gazebo, uh, using a clear pet robot, and then transfer the learned policy to a TurtleBot 2 in the real world. Uh, we show that our system can be more reliable and efficient for following in front and compared to previous methods or end-to-end -end methods as well. So for our <coughs> approach, we use our, an implementation of D4PG, which is an off-policy RL algorithm. The states of our history of the relative robot human positions and human trajectories, and their actions are now just a short navigation goal for the robot. We also employ a type of curriculum learning in order to forget this training to work. Um, additionally, once we have a predicted short-term goal, we use a classical trajectory planner, in this case TEB, to navigate the robot towards a predicted goal. For our reward function, it's shaped based on the relative human and robot position, as well as angle. So on the right, we can see that we would receive high reward if the robot is in front of the human doing front following, and we get negative reward if it is too far away from the human or not, or facing away from them. 
To improve our learning, we employ curriculum learning. We first start off with a simple trajectory where a human just moves in a straight line before moving into more challenging tasks, such as following a human in, that's moving in a circle, curves, and finally annotated paths, which are based on subhuman trajectory. Uh, for our baseline, we use the latest handcrafted following head paper, as previously mentioned, which uses EKF to predict the hu human pose motions. Uh, we also try using an end-to-end -end approach, which uses the same D4PG implementation with curriculum learning, except the policy is now outputting linear and angular velocities rather than short-term goals. Uh, so we conduct three experiments in simulation with different human trajectories. In each experiment, we predict the mean human person angle, human robot distance, and reward. For all challenging trajectories, except the straight head experiment, our method achieves a highest return. The handcrafted approach works well in straight when the human is moving in a straight line because EKF, EKF can export the linearity of the human motion. So this image shows trajectories of the robot and human during the simulated trajectory experiments for our, our method and the two baselines. The arrows on the EKF method, uh, I'm not too sure I can point to it, but they move backwards because the robot learned to stay in front while moving backwards instead of forwards, which was interesting. Um, here are some tables that compare our methods with the baselines. In each, in each experiment, the robot is placed at a certain location around the human. Um, one thing to note is that while the ET end to end method worked well in simulation, it failed to work in the real world. Therefore, the remaining videos that I'll show you will only be showing the LG, LBGP and HC methods. Um, so these experiments were conducted on our lab. We used the Vicon system to get the state information of the human and the robot. Um, the controller was only used to stop the robot in case it did something unsafe or dangerous. Um, also, so ahead, so just ahead, that would probably be the most easy trajectory for the robot to do. Well, on the bottom right, where it starts from the hind, that's the most difficult tasks. So this is for S-shaped trajectories. Um, one thing you can note is that when the robot starts from behind of the, per of the human, then sometimes it may not be able to catch up when using the handcrafted method compared to our results. So in conclusion, we propose a hybrid approach for following a head system. We address the limitations of classical approaches and end-to-end -end methods by combining deep RL and a trajectory planner. Our results show that we can outperform previous works in an obstacle-free environment. Using a trajectory planner, we improve the generalizability and safety of our policy compared to end-to-end -end methods. The key idea of predicting short-term navigation goals instead of low-level controls allow for a zero-shot transfer on new robots. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, so when talking about this today, like, I think it's become important thing. I, I missed was maybe like what was the observation in our space for the actual robot and for this um, so they were both the same. In the case, it was the relative distance of the human and robot, as well as their angles, as well as a history of the location of the human as well. Th these are all scaled down to be in the range of negative one to one. I have a question. Hmm? Have you thought about multimodal sensing for doing this task? Um, no, uh, that could pro probably be in future work because in our prior uh, work, we, we use multimodals. In this case, uh, I believe we, we took images to predict human pose uh, navigation. But the main, fo main focus of this work was how to combine deep RL and a classical trajectory model in order to do zero shot material transfer. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker once again. And now I think we'll break for lunch.